dependent on where you are. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Mike Drury from University of Florida, who will continue his tour of non-commutative function theory. Mike, please. Uh, thank you, Ilya. Uh, okay, so um, uh, last time I uh, tried to give uh, something of, of the basics. So, so what, what is a non-commutative function? Uh, and uh, what I want to do today is uh, dive deeper into one particular class of examples, namely things given by a uh, non-commutative power series uh, with an eye towards, again, this is supposed to be a focused program on function spaces. And so I want to talk about specifically the uh, parts of non-commutative function theory that deal with function spaces. And so uh, it turns out a natural thing to look at. Well, I mean, if you think about uh, function spaces in general, the sort of starter function space is, of course, the Hardy space and the disk space of square summable power series. And so if you're willing to invent power, sort of non-commutative power series or power series and non-commuting variables, uh, it would be reasonable enough to look at square summable ones and ask what they do. And so that's what I'm gonna start doing uh, today. Um, but before I do that, uh, I wanna tie up a couple of loose ends. There was a little bit at the end of yesterday's talk that I, I ran out of time for. So I wanna uh, do, do wanna mention those things. So, uh, Yesterday, I introduced these NC sets. So again, these are going to be, uh, I'm not trying to recall all the notation, but again, uh, we had a set inside this D variable matrix universe. It's a graded set. So I have uh, at each size of matrix N, I have a subset of D tuples of N by N matrices. Uh, it respects direct sums. And uh, usually we, we go a little bit farther and insist on some kind of openness. And so I was just said it's going to be open at each level, but uh, uh, at, the, at, the, at the most basic, uh, it's just closed under direct sums. Um, so one way to do topology on these sets is, is what I said, is just assume it's open at each level. And that's what we call the uh, fine topology here. Um, and that's uh, adequate for many purposes. Although uh, a thing that you uh, might dislike about the fine topology is that, well, if you're trying to, 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 to work in a sort of NC realm, uh, then, it would be natural to suppose that in your topology, your open sets should themselves be NC sets. They should be in particular closed under direct sums or respect direct sums, uh, which these uh, fine topology don't, right? Because I have a single open set at a single level and that, that would be uh, an open set for my topology, but of course that's not an NC set. Um, so you, you could go looking among, uh, look for reasonable topologies where the open sets are, are, are NC sets. And there's uh, several things you could do. There's at least two of them here that are, uh, frequently used. Uh, one is called the free topology. And so this is the topology generated by the polyhedral domains that I mentioned uh, last time. So just some matrix of uh, polynomials and you insist that that be contractive. So that includes row ball and column ball and so forth. But the point is you, you let delta run over all uh, matrix polynomials. And then this, this gives you a sort of what that generated topology that gives you a base of NC open sets. Uh, or there's what's called the fat or the uh, sometimes called the uniform topology. Uh, which is just generated by these uh, sort of NC polydisks. And again, I'm, I'm not going to use detailed things about these topologies as I go on. I'll mostly sort of ignore them or mostly work at the fine topology. But uh, I, I do want to mention these things. And in particular, what I want to, uh, again, mention without going into detail is now that we've got these sets and we've got functions and, we, and, and importantly, we've got NC derivatives, uh, you can start asking to, or wanting to do more of calculus. And you could ask, I mean, in a very elementary way, just take basic theorems of, of calculus and ask, can, do, do they have NC versions? And, and this often gets, gets interesting. So I've made a, a, a sort of a list of some of the more uh, uh, interesting ones here. Uh, so there is an NC version of the NC, NC of the inverse function theorem, uh, in fact, more than one version, because it turns out that you have to be very careful about the topology. So there, there's a version for the fine topology, a version for the uniform topology. The hypotheses are slightly different. The conclusions are slightly different. Um, so uh, I put in the footnote, the topology matters here when you, when you want to do this. Uh, likewise, there's a version of the implicit function theorem. And again, uh, the same thing is you, you have to work in the correct topology and be very careful because it, it's, if you think about what the implicit function theorem is going to say, it's going to assert you know, the, the existence of this uh, function, which is going to be continuous and differentiable and so forth. Uh, in the NC world, you'd want to, again, you have to be careful about, uh, when you talk about locally bounded or continuous or whatever, you need to be careful about the topology. 
you can do local polynomial approximation. So again, if, if you believe the point of view I tried to put forward last time that NC functions should be sort of generalized, should generalize polynomials in sort of the same way that holomorphic functions generalize ordinary polynomials. Uh, sort of an elementary fact about holomorphic functions, of course, is that uh, in their domain, they, they, I mean, in, in they can be uh, locally uniformly approximated by uh, polynomials. So you could ask for the same thing here. But as soon as you say locally uniformly, again, you're imposing a topology. And so you have to ask about what topology you're working in. Uh, so local polynomial approximation does work. Uh, this is a theorem of Bangor and, and McCarthy, but this works uh, well in the free topology. Uh, but for example, the implicit function theorem does not work well in the free topology. Um, and so a thing that happens then is it turns out there's sort of no one topology that's the correct one to use all the time. Uh, and, and this is, uh, well, I mean, it's a fact of life, but, but the point is, and I think in their book, what they say is there's no Goldilocks topology. Uh, you can do a polynomial approximation, or you could do an implicit function theorem, but you sort of can't do both. Uh, beyond just sort of ordinary uh, uh, calculus, you can get the sort of more complex analysis things. And then uh, very recently, uh, James Pascoe has proved a, a sort of rather striking version of the monodromy theorem in, in, uh, in the free setting. And I think he's going to be talking about that in his lecture uh, tomorrow. So uh, I won't say more and I'll just uh, uh, advertise that lecture. Um, uh, besides this, you can think of sort of deeper theorems in complex analysis and, and more towards the kind of function theory that people like us like to think about. Uh, like, uh, so when I say realization of monotone and convex functions here, I'm thinking of the, the Lerbner theorem about matrix monotonicity. Uh, if you know what that is. And if you don't know what that is, I will refer you to Ryan Doyle's, Doyle's talk uh, in a couple of hours, uh, and he will look at that. And again, this, this, is, this is really a case where, where this sort of uh, functional calculus point of view is, is ascendant. Uh, the whole point is if I just ask for monotone functions on an interval, well, those can be almost anything. I mean, they, they have to be measurable, but I mean, they could be discontinuous and so forth. Whereas if you insist that your function is monotone, not just at the scalar level, but matrix monotone, that is monotone also for the, the self-adjoint functional calculus, well, the famous theorem of Lerbner tells you that it actually extends to the analytic in the upper half plane and has this nether linear representation and so forth. So uh, asking for this fully matrial, matricial sort of hypothesis, this functional calculus hypothesis, lets you to often obtain uh, much stronger conclusions. Uh, and that's a sort of through going theme of, of the whole theory. So uh, again, I won't say more about that, but I'll refer you to uh, Ryan's talk uh, this afternoon. Um, but OK, uh, so moving on from that, like I said, what I really want to talk about today are things that, again, uh, look like function spaces uh, and especially uh, square summable power series. So we're going to imagine like, uh, you know, we go back to the, the, the very beginning of, of function spaces in the disk. You take a square summable power series and then uh, work from there. So OK, uh, polynomials are NC functions. We want a larger supply of them. So I said I'm going to look at power series. Um, so to set up some just the notation and, and, and the basics, so again, X will be a point uh, in the matrix universe. So a detuple of matrices of some fixed size. Um, and I want to look at power series, so I want to take monomials. So since things aren't commuting, uh, I can take products of, of the individual X's, X1 times X2 times X3 and so forth. Uh, and I get these monomials. So, so for the notation, I'll have a word in my D letters, uh, and I'll call that alpha. Uh, if the word has N letters in it, I call that the length of alpha. That's that notation. The absolute value bars is the length of alpha. Um, and then this is like a monomial. X to the alpha just means write a product of the Xs. Um, uh, if I have the word I1, I2, I3, I write the corresponding Xs in the same order. Uh, I also have an empty word. Uh, which I take to have length zero. And as you would expect by convention, X to the empty word would just be the identity matrix of, of the same size as X. Okay, so those are our sort of monomials. Uh, that's our, our multi usual sort of multi-index notation. And so then I can form these into power series. Well, a formal power series, I put coefficients in front and then ask, uh, of course, uh, when will this converge? Um, I'm not going to try to do a whole general theory of power series here. I just, I just want to, again, uh, hi highlight um, the square summable case because I want to get to, to function spaces. 
Okay, so uh, if I have such a formal power series, uh, let's look at square summable ones and so uh, and ask what can we say about the convergence? So again, um, what we have in mind is uh, in the one variable case, of course, if I take a square summable power series z to the n, uh, then we know this converges uh, in the unit disk by uh, a very simple Cauchy-Schwarz estimate. Um, and so that's why when we talk about the Hardy space, of course, we, we talk about the function theory in the disk. I mean, the point is, it's not that we pick the disk first. We choose first to work with square summable series and the disk is forced on us because that's the domain where they naturally converge. So uh, what I'd like to do, hopefully, is look at square summable power series in this NC setting and ask, uh, is there some kind of natural domain on which these series converge? And then that's the, the domain on which I should uh, be doing my uh, this, this theory of NC uh, function spaces, well, at least for this square summable case. So uh, I want to analyze the convergence of this series, and we'll do we can do this very concretely, and I'll and I'll prove a, a simple estimate that will uh, be sort of satisfying when you see it. Um, and the way to do it, uh, the first thing we'll do, which is uh, the sort of standard thing you would do even in commuting uh, in the commuting multivariable situation, is it's it's convenient to organize your series into homogeneous degrees. So uh, for each uh, length n. I group together all the monomials of degree exactly n, so all the words of the length exactly n, uh, and I'll sort of grade this series. Okay, whoops, this is a typo. This should be big N there. So I sort of grade this series by homogeneous degree. Uh, this inner sum is, of course, a finite sum. If I have D letters, then there are uh, D to the N terms here, just all the words in D letters. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll estimate those homogeneous terms individually and then uh, sum the estimates to estimate the whole series. So uh, how should I estimate this homogeneous sum? Well, uh, so here's a simple way to do it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write, uh, okay, so C alpha x to the alpha. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to write this as a row of x's times a column of scalars. So what I can do is I can uh, list all the monomials in some order, I mean, lexicographic order, it doesn't matter, but just list all the monomials in some order. And then take the x's and write them in the rows of x alpha, x beta, and so forth. Um, so I list all those monomials in the rows. I make one long uh, matrix uh, uh, out of each monomial. And then I can write you know, the c alpha times the identity of the correct size and c beta times the identity of the correct size, and so on. Uh, and so I can, so this big matrix I can factor as a long row times a tall column. And then what I'll do is to take norms, well, I'll just say the norm of this is going to be less than the norm of this row of x's times, well, the norm of this column of, of scalar matrices. But I mean, this we know what the norm of this column of scalar matrices precisely because they're scalar. Here, I'm just going to get the L2 sum of these uh, scalars uh, over all the words of length n. Okay, so uh, I have in the L2 some of the coefficients there, and that's why I did it this way, because again, our assumption is that the whole series is, is L2 coefficients. Uh, but now I need to find an intelligent way to estimate this row of all the words. So how can we do that? Uh, well, rather than, than, than do it in the general case, so let me just show, show you a, a, a small example, and then you'll see how it goes. So let me just take two letters, uh, and degree two. And so my, my rather than write x1, x2, I'm going to write uh, x and y for my variables. And so my row would look like xx, xy, yx, yy. I want to estimate the norm of that. Well, rather than estimate the norm, let me do the square norm so I can take adjoints. Okay, so now if I multiply that out, what I get is a sum. And so uh, I'll get x, x star, x star, x. In the next pair, I get x, y, y star, x star. And notice that I can, I can pull out an x on both sides. So I x, x star plus y, y star, x star. And then in, in the second two terms, I'll have a similar thing with, with a y on the outside. Y, 
I start. And now if I stare at this, what I see here is this expression in the middle is exactly what I'd be looking at if I was looking at the row norm. So this thing will be less than uh, the row norm of xy squared times the identity, and the same thing there. So this whole thing as a positive matrix is going to be less than the row norm of xy times xx star plus yy star. But then that's the row norm again. So I get the row norm xy now to the fourth power times the identity. So what that tells me is the, norm, the square norm of this thing is going to be less than the row norm of just the original x to the uh, to the fourth power, and the point is four is two times the degree. So uh, if you iterate that argument, what I get is that uh, if I look at in degree n, I make the row of all monomials of degree n like that, I just iterate that argument n times, the square norm of that is less than the row norm of x to the two n power. So uh, what I do is go back to the estimate I did before. Okay, so I have this row of x's times the column of c's. The c's are estimated by this, uh, just, well, the norm of the c's is the Euclidean norm. I have that row of x's, which now I just estimated as the nth power uh, of the row norm of x. And this is good because now what I see is as long as the row norm of x is gonna be less than one, I can control this by, well, I have the square sum of the c's, which is gonna be finite, uh, times this geometric thing. And so ultimately I'll control this, this whole series by a, a geometric series and I win. So if I put that all together, if I sum up, uh, say the first K of them, uh, I apply my estimates in each homogeneous term. Uh, I get, so in each homogeneous term, I get the Kth power of the row norm times the sum of the squares of the C's in that degree. Uh, and then if I apply Cauchy-Schwartz to this, I get, again, a geometric sum there and the square sum of the Cs. And what you end up with is the following proposition. So what you can say is that if the series is square summable and it forms NC power series, it will converge in the row ball as long as the row norm of X is strictly less than one. And uh, if I go back up for a second, this geometric estimate, because again, I have this uh, geometric series here. So this geometric estimate tells me that the uh, for each individual x, the norm of the matrix fx, again, this is just going to be a single n by n matrix, uh, is less than, well, okay, so it's with the square roots and everything, one over square root, one minus root of x squared, times the L2 sum of the coefficients. And I said that this we were going to end up with uh, what I called a, a satisfying estimate, because again, if you think about how, the, how this estimate works in just the Hardy space in one variable, the crude estimate on the, the, the point-wise value of a Hardy space function is exactly this. It's the L2 norm of f over square root one minus mod z squared. By really the same estimate we just did, just in one variable, it's simpler. Um, but we get, ex but we get uh, uh, the convergence in the row ball with this uh, good norm estimate. All right, so what this suggests is then, well, this uh, square summable power series will converge in the, well, it doesn't suggest it, it does say that this square summable power series will converge in the row ball. So we should, uh, like in the Hardy space, we worked in the disk. Now to analyze these series, we should work in the row ball. But if I go back and look at that estimate I did, I mean, I, I, I rigged the argument so that we land on the row ball in the end, but I could have done it differently. Because when I began, of course, what I said I was going to do was I was going to write this uh, sum C alpha X alpha as I wrote it as a row of X's times a column of C's. But of course, I, I could have done, I could have in exactly the same way written it as a row of scalar matrices times a column of these monomials. Right? I mean, these two things are equal because the identities will commute with the x's. So I could have done all my estimating starting with this column of x's like that. And if you run through the same argument, well, it's no surprise that uh, what you'd land on then is the column norm of x instead of the row norm. And indeed, you get exactly, uh, I guess I gave myself some more room. But you know, let me write it, then I'll, I'll have it typed on the next slide. Um, so by the same reasoning. Uh, we get that, uh, well, I think I just wrote it here. Maybe, maybe I'll 
Um, yeah. So anyway, if you do the same argument, just if I had factored that thing in the opposite way, uh, I would get that same square summable power series. Well, it converges in the row ball, but it also converges in the column ball. And we know that I mentioned last time, while those two domains look the same at level one, they're different at higher levels. So it converges in the row ball and the column ball simultaneously. Um, so then which, which, one, which one of those domains should I work in? Well, now it's sort of maybe the right answer is, well, maybe neither of them. Maybe I should uh, uh, look at this more closely and figure out what sort of, uh, could, I, could I have done this, this, this calculation in a more organized way? So because I factored it one way, got the row, one way, got the column. But presumably, there's lots of other different, uh, more elaborate kind of uh, estimates I could have done there that, that I still could have got something out of. So uh, let's think about how we estimate those homogeneous terms uh, in a more organized way. So let me write down some uh, mess of an expression and then uh, talk our way through it. So uh, here's a quantity I'm going to define. So let's read this from the inside out. So in the inside of this norm here, I have these homogeneous terms that I'm trying to estimate. Uh, the thing that I highlighted there. So the goal was to get the norm of that thing. So ultimately what we wanted was to control that by the L2 norm of the coefficients uh, times basically something geometric. So I'm hoping to get L2 norm of Cs times like an R to the N there. So if I wanted to get an R to the N out of it uh, with the L2 norm of the Cs, well, to get the L2 norm of the Cs, what I can do is I can normalize the Cs to have soup norm, uh, sorry, not to have soup norm. I can normalize the Cs to be uh, have square norm, Euclidean norm of one. And then what I do is I take this expression, if the C's have Euclidean norm one, I want this, this norm to look like R to the N. To get the R out, I should take the Nth root. Um, I don't need it to literally look like R to the N. I only need it to look like R to the N in the limit, so asymptotically, so take the limit for at least lin soup. And I wanted it to be less than one, so I have a geometric estimate. So what I can do then is define this quantity sigma X to be this you know, rather complicated expression. And if I do that, then as long as this thing is less than one, um, I can run the same argument that I did and get a geometric estimate, at least on the tail. I can control at least the, since I'm only saying the limb soup here, I'll control at least the tail uh, by a geometric series. And I'll get the series to converge uh, whenever this quantity is less than one. So. My square summable power series will converge whenever this uh, monstrosity is less than one. And the estimates that we did showed that, uh, well, what we, what we saw was that uh, the estimates we did show that sigma x is less than the row norm of x. Sorry. And this sigma of x is less than also the column norm of x. Um, in, in the literature, it's more common to use the Greek letter rho instead of sigma, but I'm using the English word rho to say rho, and I can't pronounce the two things differently. So um, that's just the convention for the talk. But um, OK, so whenever, so, so really uh, beyond either the row ball or the column ball, I have this more complicated domain, namely the, the set of all x's where sigma of x is less than 1, uh, and it will converge whenever that happens. And if you unpack the de definition of this thing, what you can see is that this is actually uh, an NC domain. It's an NC set because this will this, this quantity sigma will respect direct sums. Um, you can also see, and in fact, the thing that's sort of better than either the row or the column norm is that this quantity is a similarity invariant. Because if I conjugate S by a symbol X by a similarity, uh, I can pull it out and uh, uh, the, the, I'll get this sort of condition number of S, but that will wash away in the limit. Um, so, so really, my, my uh, square summable power series will converge on this larger domain, whatever it is. But we have this sort of formidable quantity uh, sigma x. But let's claim that we can actually understand this in a good way. So all right, so I've defined this uh, mess of a thing. So, so, so one way to kind of catch your breath here and figure out what's going on is to ask, what would this look like if we had done it in one variable? If I had done this in one variable, well, uh, my, what would be my, my words? My words would just, I'd only have one letter. So my, my monoid, my words would just be, you know, positive integers. So in home, my homogeneous polynomials, I'd only have one of them. I'd have x to the nth power. Uh, I could put coefficients in front of that, but I'm looking, by normalizing my coefficients to have norm one. So I'm just putting unimodular coefficients in front so I could ignore that. 
So I'm just looking at the norm of x to the n, and then I'm taking the nth root. There's no soup here because again, it's just, and then I'm taking the limit and asking that to be less than one. Well, okay, so now we have something familiar because of course this is nothing but the Gelfand formula for the spectral radius of X. And in fact, uh, we know from the Gelfand formula, I don't need to say limb soup. I can actually just, the, the limit actually exists. And it turns out that for this quantity, likewise, the same is true. I, I, in fact, the limit exists and, and I don't need to say limb soup there, uh, which is immediately obvious, but that's okay. But the important point, of course, is that uh, we have a now a natural interpretation for this quantity of sigma x. It, it, it's some kind of a spectral radius. Um, and in the literature, it's known variously as either the joint spectral radius uh, or the outer spectral radius. And it's quite an interesting quantity in its own right. And, and I'm going to um, only say a couple more things about it and then leave it behind. But it, but it, it will uh, figure into some of the things I want to say uh, in the last lecture. So. Uh, but I, it will help me sort of uh, resolve this question about the convergence of, of these series. Because again, we know that the, the series will converge uh, whenever this quantity is less than one. Uh, but okay, so this is some notion of a joint spectral radius. So uh, actually, I, I wanted to say something. Okay, uh, well, let me just say it, okay. So uh, here is uh, a theorem, uh, which is due originally to Popescu. Um, and was revisited uh, uh, in a subsequent paper by uh, Solomon Shalit Jemovich and also in a survey by uh, Pasco, which uh, has a number of nice results. This, this Pasco survey uh, has a number of uh, uh, interesting results about this uh, joint spectral radius. But this theorem that I've written here, I say X is similar to, so, so what I mean is uh, X is similar to uh, some tuple Y uh, with row norm less than one. So in other words, uh, X is similar to a row contraction. to a strict row contraction. X is similar to a strict row contraction if and only if uh, its outer spectral radius is strictly less than one. And again, if you think about what this says in one variable, again, this spectral radius is just the ordinary spectral radius. Uh, this is the fairly well-known uh, rota strang theorem which just says that for any uh, matrix or indeed any uh, bounded operator in Hilbert space, you are similar to a strict contraction if and only if the spectral radius is less than one. So we have a very nice uh, multivariate NC analog of this fact. A corollary of that then is that, well, if you think about convergence, I said, well, actually these series are gonna converge everywhere in this sort of spectral radius ball. But a corollary of this rota strang type result uh, uh, is that, well, everything in everything in this spectral radius ball is uh, have all has spectral radius less than one, and therefore is similar to something in the row ball. So, in fact, uh, if I wanted to, I could get away with just looking at my series in the row ball, even though they all converge in some strictly larger domain. The values in that larger domain are determined by the values in the row ball because remember our NC functions respect similarities. Uh, I, I guess I should have mentioned that this is this is important, but but it's clear now. So remember, our, our f uh, was this convergent power series, and the point is, once this power series converges, and we have that norm estimate, um, once this power series converges, that of course the, the the function is going to respect direct sums and similarities because it's a limit of polynomials, and polynomials respect direct sums and similarities. So. Um, I, I do have the option of just working in the row ball if I wanted to, uh, because then the, the values of F will, will be on, on the whole similarity, uh, sorry, the whole uh, spectral radius ball would be determined by their values in the row ball. But nonetheless, at this point, I don't think I've made a convincing case for why I should prefer the row ball to uh, either the column ball or the spectral radius ball or any of the other, other domains. However, I claim there is a reason that when you're dealing with these square summable power series, uh, there is a reason to prefer the row ball as a domain. Uh, which I won't tell you today. I'll save that for the third lecture when we talk about multipliers. Uh, but ultimately, uh, I do want it, to, it, it does sort of make sense. The, the row ball is in some sense the natural domain uh, for these things, at least from one point of view, uh, and I'll get to that later. Um, maybe while I'm here, let me mention one other fact. Uh, it's not, it, it's sort of tangential, but um, 
uh, useful. The one way you can prove a bunch of things about this uh, outer spectral radius or this joint spectral radius is to show that, in fact, um, this complicated quantity that I wrote down um, is, in fact, genuinely the spectral radius of an ordinary matrix. So, in fact, what I claim is true, um, you can find a nice proof of this in the, the PASCO paper. Uh, the the spectra, this, this joint spectral radius of X is, in fact, uh, obtained, if I look at the ordinary spectral radius of the following matrix, I look at the sum XJ tensor, so the tensor here is the Kronecker tensor product, XJ bar. So bar here is the complex conjugate, so not the adjoint. There's no transpose here, just the complex conjugate of the entries. Uh, if I take that, so the, this is now just going to be uh, uh, an N squared by N squared matrix, is like the Kronecker tensor product. Uh, and if I throw in a, a square root there to get it scaled correctly, uh, this outer spectral radius is just the uh, ordinary spectral radius well, square root uh, of that matrix. Um, and this is also connected to something called the quantum Perron Frobenius theorem, which would take me uh, too far uh, afield. Um, but this is a very interesting quantity and it's connected to a, a bunch of other things. Uh, and I will revisit it, like I said, in, in the, the, the last lecture, because we will have, have, have use for this again. But anyway, uh, what I want to do now is get back to uh, the, the power series uh, themselves. And OK, so where are we? We're looking at uh, NC power series with square summable coefficients. Uh, even though we could look at it in the spectral radius ball, I am, for the moment, just going to restrict myself to the row ball. Partly because in the row ball, uh, I don't just have that it converges. I mean, I have that it converges with this norm estimate. Um, and and, I, and uh, if I look at this norm estimate, again, this is uh, supposed to be familiar looking because it reminds us of exactly the sort of uh, cheap norm estimate we get in the Hardy space in the disk. Uh, the first thing you do with this, once you've got this estimate in the Hardy space in the disk, is you say, well, uh, if I look at uh, points in the disk, and I look at the map that sends f to f of z, well, this is telling you exactly that this is a bounded point evaluation. Uh, if f is in the Hardy space. And once I have bounded point evaluations, I have reproducing kernels, and we can get into the reproducing kernel Hilbert space theory and so forth. Uh, but now it's clear that that happens here, at least if I work in the row ball. So, so again, if I worked in the spectral radius ball, I'd have to think about this a little bit further. And you can say something, but uh, you have convergence, but you don't quite have uh, an estimate like this. But So I won't worry about it right now. But anyway, if I work in the row ball, I have this nice norm estimate. So what that means is if I work in the row ball, if I, if I, and I take a point in W in the row ball at level N, I can look at the map that sends F to F of W. So this F now, uh, it's a square summable power series. And I guess I should have said, of course, I can make this set of square summable power series into a Hilbert space, right? Uh, if I want, I can call it sort of the NCH2 space. Uh, and of course, the inner product is just going to be the L2 inner product on the coefficients. If I have C alpha, let's say D alpha bar, like the coefficients for G. So just with the L2 inner product, it's a Hilbert space. Uh, and we want to make it into a, an NC Hilbert function space. And the point is that uh, what this estimate shows you is that at each level n, the map that sends an f in the Hilbert space to uh, this n by n matrix is going to be bounded. So I give h this NC H2 space, I give it the H2 norm, I give the n by n matrices the usual norm. Um, and this tells me I'm going to get uh, a, a bounded uh, well. OK, so it's not a linear functional anymore, because this f of w, of course, is matrix valued rather than scalar valued. So, so one thing that I could do if I wanted was to say, well, I'm going to have not a single reproducing kernel that evaluates a function at a point, but rather uh, some kind of graded kernel where uh, I have these matrix valued point evaluations at every level. I could do that, although a drawback to doing that is, is really what you want to do with a reproducing kernel is, is the point is you're evaluating at a single point. Uh, you get a scalar. And so the point is a bounded point evaluation then by the Reese representation theorem is given by inner product against the vector. So I really want to do that. If I'm going to get an inner product against a vector, then uh, I really need to have a scalar valued evaluation. 
but that's easy enough to do because all I, all I need to do is say, well, I'm going to take my matrix W and then pick any pair of vectors uh, X and U in uh, CN with the same size as W and uh, then just hit F of W with this uh, bilinear form. Uh, take F of W, apply to U, and then take the inner product with X. Uh, so all that's really happening there is I'm taking F, I'm evaluating at W, I get this matrix F of W. Now I write this matrix F of W in some arbitrary basis and then read off an entry of that matrix. So basically I, I, I get a, a scalar value mapping just by writing down the matrix, write it in some basis and read off one entry. So reading off one entry of this matrix, that's a scalar valued uh, bounded point evaluation. And therefore by the Reese representation theorem, it must be given by inner product. Sorry inner product against some element of the Hilbert space, uh, which will depend now on these three pieces of data. It will depend on the matrix and this pair of vectors that I chose. Uh, however, uh, I mean, there's a little bit of uh, uh, non-uniqueness here because um, I can choose a different triple W, U, X. I can choose another triple, say, W prime, U prime, X prime. There will be many different triples that actually give me the same vector here, right? Uh, and the way to see that is to remember that F is similarity invariant. And so if I, if I replace W by a similarity uh, and similarly uh, move the U and the X by the similarity, uh, I can find different triples that actually evaluate to the same thing. So the, the, this, uh, if I know this kernel function here, it doesn't uniquely determine the triple, but in the end, it turns out that's okay. It's not, not a thing we need to worry about. Uh, but the point is for each such triple, we get uh, this sort of point evaluation. And then the next thing you would do in, in the classical setting is organize these into a theory of reproducing kernels. So I'll say a little bit about that, not in, in great detail, but uh, at least enough to, to get us where we want to go. So we have these uh, point evaluations. Uh, which are maybe I should I should put this so so this again this is the inner product of f with this kernel function k w x u uh, and if you were doing this in the Hardy space the first thing you would do is well you do this nice calculation that that gives you an explicit expression for the reproducing kernel which is given by this rational function and so forth and I'll say something about that towards the end. Um, but let's actually look at what this calculation does. Okay, so if I write down again my f uh, I should have written it there is uh, C alpha, Z to the alpha. So if I write down F of W and then take this inner product, well, by continuity, I can pass the inner product with the U and the X inside the sum. So uh, this inner product is given by this sum. But remember, the inner product is just the L2 inner product on the coefficient. So this is just the coefficients of the F times the complex conjugates of the coefficients of K. So that means I can stare at this sum and read off the coefficients of k. So the alpha coefficient uh, of k, because remember, k is in the Hilbert space, so k is given by a square summable power series. The coefficients of k are just given by that expression. And there's a couple of different ways I'll I can handle it. I'll handle it one way now, and I'll handle it the other way uh, in a few minutes. But one thing I can do is if I want the complex conjugate of this thing, well, again, this is really just uh, the inner product. Oops. This expression, uh, if I wrote it out, would just be inner product W alpha U X in CN. And so if I like, I can just switch, I can complex conjugate it uh, by switching the inner order of the uh, inner product uh, and then moving the W over and taking an adjoint and that leaves me with this expression. So uh, by taking complex conjugates, I get that these expressions with the W alpha stars now are the coefficients of K. The reason to do this, of course, is that uh, in the classical theory of kernels, then what you do is you take the inner product of one kernel against the other kernel, and you get this sort of bivariate function, this KZW, and you study properties of that bivariate uh, function. So here it's slightly more complicated, but in the end, it sort of works out in a reasonable way. So if I do this calculation now for KWXU and another point KZYV, I've skipped the steps, but you write it all out. Um, if you write it all out, what happens is the X sits on the outside there, the Y star sits on the outside there. In the middle, I have the Z to the alphas, the adjoints of the W alphas, and then this uh, thing in the middle, this V U star. And remember, V here is a column, and U star is a row. 
So this thing in the middle is really a rank one matrix. And notice too that the Z and the W don't, be, don't have to be the same size here. If Z is of size N and W of size is of size M, then my VU star is a rank one matrix of size N by M. So this whole product is then a matrix of size uh, N by M. It doesn't have to be square. It's square times rectangular times uh, square. Uh, times like that. So, well, those are bad shapes, but anyway. Um, so what it means is uh, I, can, I can interpret the kernel this way. I can view this kernel as a map that takes this inner matrix of size M by N, puts, squeezes it in between the Z and W and sum and outputs another matrix of size uh, N, N by M. And so really what I have here is, well, the W and the X and the Y on the outside is reading off an entry of this matrix. But what I've highlighted in blue is really the way I want to think of this is I'm going to take this matrix in the middle, apply this KZW. So what KZW, this bivariate function is really going to be is a linear map. So when, when Z is of size N and W is of size M, it's going to be a linear map on the space of uh, rectangular M by N matrices. And so I think on the next slide, I've cleaned this all up. And so uh, I can interpret it like this. So this is of size uh, M by N and size uh, M by N if Z is of size M and W is of size N. Okay. So the way to one way to interpret this kernel then as a bivariate function is if you uh, uh, notice these are rank one things, but by taking linear combinations, I can take linear combinations of rank one and get an EP. Um, but a way, to, a, a coherent way to think about this bivariate function, this kernel as a bivariate function, then is as a, a, a mapping on uh, rectangular matrices like this, again of all sizes. And uh, if I wanted to, I could go further and I could talk about well, since the original functions f had you know respected direct sums and similarities, there is a sense in which you know this bivariate k function k z z w will respect direct sums in the z's and w's. It will respect similarities in the Z's and W's by formulas, which I could write down, but I won't. But if you wanted to puzzle it out, I mean, it's, it's easy enough to work out from, from what we've said. Um, but it just ends up being a soup of letters, which is sort of uh, not very appealing to read on the slide, and it's bad enough as it is. But anyway, the point is, the, the, the way to think about the bivariate function is then uh, it, it's this mapping uh, of all these different sizes. And the important thing is, uh, Reproducing kernels should be positive in some sense. And let me maybe not say that yet. But um, uh, anyway, what happens is well, once you've got started this way, uh, it's possible to build up a general NC theory of reproducing kernels uh, along these lines. And, and rather than try to say all of it, uh, I'm just going to, I've hopefully convinced you that it should sort of work. Um, and this paper, Ball Marks and Vinikoff 2016, uh, works out in great detail uh, this whole theory in, in very great generality. Um, but uh, the sort of executive summary for what we want to say is uh, the things that you hope to be true are going to be true as long as you work out the correct statements. If I have a, a space of NC functions on some you know, NC domain and the sort of point evaluations are bounded in the sense that I described, then you do get one of these uh, what are called CP NC kernels. So the CP is for completely positive. So what that's going to mean is the way that the kernel is positive is if I look at Z and Z, uh, and I evaluate that, that P, that's going to be positive whenever P is positive. And in fact, stronger than that, the map that sends KZP to KZZP, this is all square now, is a completely positive map uh, from MN to MN. Um, so that's, that's the correct sense in which the kernel is positive. Positive is definite, positive is semi-definite. It's completely positive like that. So uh, Hilbert function spaces where the point evaluations are bounded give you kernels. Uh, conversely, there's an Aaron Shine Moore type theory that says if I have a kernel that has all the right properties, it's positive in the appropriate sense, in the CP sense, and respects direct sounds and similarities, and so on. Uh, it will be the kernel, there will be a space of NC functions on this domain where uh, that has it as the kernel. So uh, uh, there's much, much more that can be said beyond this. I mean, uh, and I haven't given the precise statements here, but uh, anyway, the, uh, it's a long paper and I have, and there's many different variations. You, you can do versions where you don't worry about similarities. You just do grading and direct sums, and then you don't worry about local boundedness. There's a lot of variations of this, but uh, I'll just, hopefully you'll believe me if I tell you in the broad strokes sort of 
it all works. You just have to figure out the, the correct statement. For that. So uh, that's sort of a, a detour into sort of general statements about kernels, but let's go back to our, our specific kernel. And uh, again, uh, we have all these sort of complicated calculations with the Ws and the Xs and the Us, and it, and it can get kind of wearying. So uh, let's pause for breath again. And uh, again, the, the sort of if, if you if you get tired and you just want to figure out what's going on, uh, a good thing to do as a sanity check is always figure out what happens at level one, because uh, at level one you're dealing with ordinary scalar functions and they're holomorphic, and you can see what happens. So let's do a calculation of what our kernel for this. Uh, again, this is our our, our NC Hardy space, uh, our space of square summable NC power series. It has this sort of you know, complicated you know, CPNC kernel, but what does that kernel look like at level one? The point is at level one, we can calculate very explicitly. So level one, these are one by one matrices. So I just have a, a, a row of scalars there, a row of uh, Ws there. Again, in the row ball, uh, what this means is the Euclidean norm is less than one. So these uh, Zs and Ws uh, belong to the ordinary open Euclidean ball BD in D variables. Uh, and since I mean, since these are one by one matrices, this business of you know evaluating the vectors in the bilinear forms is sort of superfluous. So for these one by one vectors where I evaluate everything, I'll just set all those to one. Okay, so then if, if I wash out, if I go back and uh, look at that expression, the, the sort of complicated expression that I wrote, uh, again, the Z's and the W's in here, if I look in, in, in this bit, the Z's and the W's are all just scalars, and the Z to the alpha is then just this usual multi-index notation. But note that the alpha is a non-commuting word. So Z to the alpha, I mean, I'm still writing them different things in different orders. I'm not sort of grouping the terms. I mean, I could, but I won't. Uh, this VU in the middle is gone. That's just one. And the X's and the Y and the outsides are gone. Those are just one. So really, all that I get is a sum of Z to the alpha, W bar to the alpha uh, over, again, all words and all, all these non-commuting words in, in, in the D letters. So to, to work out what this says, again, we'll do the same trick we did before, which was group it into homogeneous terms. If I group it into homogeneous terms of degree N, well, now look at what this sum is. It's a sum Z to the alpha, W to the alpha uh, over all words of length N. And if you do a little bit of combinatorics, it's, it's almost trivial, but... If I look, if I write out uh, the sum z1 w1 bar up to zd wd bar, and raise that to the nth power and multiply it out, well, if I don't group any terms, what I'll get is simply all words of length n in the w in the z's times the corresponding word of length n in the w's. Now, if I if I remember that these z's and stuff commute, I can sort of group those terms, but it's better if I don't in some sense because now I can just write this as this sum uh, zj wj bar to the n. But this sum now is, of course, just the usual Euclidean inner product in CD. And now that's just a geometric series. And so what, I fall, what falls out is an extremely simple rational function of two variables, of these two, com well, not two variables, I mean, bivariate in the Z and the W, the Z and the W are themselves uh, in CD, um, which looks, if I did it in one variable, of course, would be the Zago kernel for the Hardy space. So what that tells me is that if I restrict everything to level one, I'm working with some reproducing kernel Hilbert space of holomorphic functions in the Euclidean ball, the space with this kernel, and this space has a name. Uh, it was already mentioned in, in Raphael's talk and, and in uh, Jelly's talk yesterday. Many of us know what it is, the Drury Arvison space. And so one way in which the Drury Arvison space arises naturally, um, if you allow that non-commutative things are natural, then one way that it arises naturally is simply what you get if you take this sort of NC reproducing kernel Hilbert space of square summable series and restrict it to level one. So uh, as has already been noted, uh, the Drury Arvison space will be the subject of uh, Michael Hartz's lectures next week. Uh, but I want to, uh, and I'll say more about this connection in, in uh, the, the last lecture tomorrow as well. Uh, but the point is we have this connection now is if I take, uh, a function in this, you know, NC Hardy space, and just restrict it to uh, level one. Uh, that gives me a map. This H2D is uh, the usual notation for the uh, uh, Drury Arvison space. So what I get is, and and because the kernels line up, uh, this map is a partial isometry. 
Uh, but conversely, again, which you can see by, by a kernel argument or otherwise, uh, given uh, any function f in H2D, uh, there exists uh, a unique, let me call it, say, f tilde in the NC Hardy space, so that the norms are the same. And uh, f just is this restriction of f tilde to level one. So given any function in the, in the drury arvison space, it has a unique norm-preserving free lift, sort of there's a unique way to extend it to all the higher levels to give me a, a so that it's represented by a square summable NC power series with the same Hilbert space norm. Okay, uh, and this fact, uh, together with a companion fact about the multipliers of these spaces that I'll talk about in the last lecture tomorrow, uh, is what opens up the possibility of proving things about this sort of space of ordinary holomorphic functions via non-commutative methods. And I'll give one example of a theorem uh, of that sort next time. And so I'm out of time, but maybe uh, I'll just throw up this last slide and it will be a segue into tomorrow. Uh, if I did that same calculation I tried to do for the, uh, the, the that landed on the, the, the Drury Arvison kernel, for a general point ZW, uh, I could still do that same algebra. And the point is, the same algebra, uh, I would get these Z alphas and W alpha bars. Again, this W bar is the entrywise complex conjugate, not the adjoint. The general form of the kernel, uh, I'll, I'll I'll say this carefully at the beginning of the next lecture, but the general form of the kernel still has this sort of rational kind of aspect to it. It looks like it's basically going to be one minus W bar tensor Z inverse with some vectors outside. Uh, and it turns out this is what's called a descriptor realization of an NC rational function. So the, in general, this sort of NC Zago kernel is a rational function in the NC sense. Uh, and I'll say more about that uh, next time and talk about multipliers and, and shift operators and invariant subspaces and Burling theorem and those kinds of things for this NC space. Uh, so I'll stop there and then I'll, I'll wrap this up uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for a wonderful talk. Questions, comments, suggestions? Well, if there are no questions, let's thank Mike again. Thank you. Thank you.